Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of Vox Vomitus. I am your host, author Jennifer Ann Gordon, the author of Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, as well as the Hotel series and the upcoming novel Pretty Ugly. I am joined today, as always, by my Vox Vomitus vixen, author Allison Martine, author of The Bourbon Books. And today, those of you who are watching live or watching the replay, you can see we have a huge team of authors with us today. We have the three masterminds behind Vampire the Masquerade's novel, Walk Among Us. So this is very exciting. We have Caitlin Starling. We have Cassandra Chaw. I hope I'm saying your last name right. Uh, and Genevieve. No. no? <laughs> what is it? Um, it's kind of like the sound a crow makes. A sound. Oh, it's not Cassandra clear. It's crow. Clearing its throat in the beginning. Call. Okay. Call. Yes. Okay, that's easy. Cassandra, call. And Genevieve Gornacek. Welcome, everybody. This is usually when we drink and I just toss it over to the guests so they can introduce themselves. So let's start oh, wow. with Caitlin. So, yep. My name is Caitlin. I am the author of um, the Land of Milk and Honey inside of the. Well, Walk Among Us collection that we're talking about today, as well as the novels, The Luminous Dead and forthcoming The Death of Jane Lawrence. Um, I write all sorts of weird psychological horror fiction. I can't be contained to one genre. And um, I have brought a very special bad decision with me today. <laughs> it's yes. called Underberg. And at some point I will open this and, and drink it live on camera. But um, it's a very weird, heavily cloved medicinal alcoholic shot. I'm so Which curious. I feel like is really my brand. So, you know, it's just, that's <laughs> all you need to know about me. That and, um, but the new book has like six abdominal surgery scenes in it. So <laughs> that gets in there. Nice. <laughs> Cassandra. Hi, um, I'm Cassandra Call. I wrote fine print in the novella collection. I write a lot of horror, a lot of dark fantasy. I have two books coming out later this year, The All-Consuming World, which is a cyberpunk heist that has a whole bunch of ex-criminals coming together for one last job that involves them stealing a planet and nothing but blackened teeth, where five friends decide they're going to celebrate a wedding in an abandoned house in the middle of nowhere, and things go very, very bad. That's my dream wedding. Yeah, it is. I was going to say, Jen, why did you advise for that after you got married on Halloween last year? Because I was awesome. already at a haunted bed and breakfast. <laughs> but it, it, might, it might as well have been abandoned because it was in the middle of COVID and we weren't the only people there. Okay, Genevieve, Genevieve. we have one more. Okay. Sorry, we have to rail quickly. <laughs> it's okay. Um, hi, I'm Genevieve Gornachak. I wrote A Sheep Among Wolves in the Walk Among Us collection. Uh, my debut novel came out in February. It's called The Witch's Heart, and it's a reimagining of Norse mythology from the point of view of a minor side character. I love that. So Genevieve, um, yours was the very first book in this collection, or novella in this collection, and I was immediately kind of like pulled in because you were writing about OSU. And I lived in Columbus for 12 years and my husband went to OSU, so it brought back a lot of um, horrifying memories, but yeah. also yeah. also fond memories of us falling in love. But I was so just like, shut up, this is about Ohio. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. I went to OSU, so I mean, like my story may or may not be uh, like a secret love letter to Buckeye Donuts, but that's... <laughs> I felt like it was. I just, like, I always I get very excited when I know where something is set. Yes. So I'm always just like, oh my gosh, I know exactly the makeup of High Street. And then when you yeah. start talking about the short north, I'm like, oh, I wonder where she is. Well, and that food part is very much one of those visceral memories that anybody who's eaten one of those is right there with you going, I need one of these pumpkin spice donuts. They're worth fighting over. Yes. <laughs> so um, I have to ask, Allison and I have never played Vampire the Masquerade. Have Sorry. you all played it? No? Yes, far too much. Okay. Okay, okay, raise your hand if you have. Just Cassandra. Okay. I binge read the, the rule books when I was a teenager. Like I, I have been immersed in rule, but I have never actually been able to play it. I remember in Ohio, there would be a large group of people very close to my house that were always playing it on Friday evenings in Westerville. <laughs> and we were gonna suggest Genevieve was one of them. 
but now you <laughs> say you weren't playing, so <laughs> there, was that theory. <laughs> there was also a group of people at one of like the pedestrian malls at Ohio State that would like gather in the middle of the mall and like we'd see them sitting around. I was like, I wonder what those guys are doing. And I realized they were playing Vampire the Masquerade, and I was like, huh, so like thanks for being the low-key inspiration for me setting my story in Columbus. <laughs> See, that's God, I, I was really, really wondering if you were one of those people that I, was, I like, wish. would drive by every Friday night and be like, what are all those goth kids doing? <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, I sincerely wish, but I did not have friends who played tabletop RPGs until I was um, like in my late 20s. So. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Cassandra would have adopted you at her house. I know. House. I so would have where absolutely. did you play? Huh? Where were you playing? So you you actually were playing. What time in your life were you doing this? What oh, kind of group did you have? My late teens, my early twenties, when I was back in Malaysia, I did a lot of it online. Some of it in person as well. Yeah. Um, I was really into it. I had the rule books memorized, and I was so into it. In fact, I ended up helping to write some of the rule books as I got older. Okay, that's, that's fabulous, cool. amazing. And then Caitlin probably read them. Yes. <laughs> and I found out later though, like before, after I read all the rule books, but before I was brought on to write for this project, I found out that my godmother used to play a whole lot of Vampire the Masquerade, possibly in Columbus, definitely in Cleveland, but I think there might've been some time in Columbus too. Oh did, um, you, did you see if she was in a mall at any time? I was not even conceived yet. <laughs> I was not there. Or I guess no, no, it would have been in the nineties. Okay. I was like four. I feel very old now. Let's I, go. I know. I'm like, wow. <laughs> wow. I'm really old. Hold on. I'm just going to drink. Well, and when we found out we were having this group on, when I figured out what it was related to, I immediately went to my Facebook page and said, okay, all you high school friends, raise your hand if you played. And I know who you are. So don't don't try to deny it because you can't. You know, I remember you all sitting around in your trench coats and using words that went right over my head. And they all ended up in this book. So I was wondering, for anyone who's reading the book, and isn't already familiar with it, is there a resource that they should look at that would kind of walk them through some of the, like the structures of the organization, or would you say that they would just get it from reading it? I think they would get it from reading it. Like it would help if you know the basic source books, especially the ones that have been most recently published, but like one of the objectives, and um, correct me if I'm wrong guys, but like <laughs> One of the objectives here was for us to create something that was accessible and approachable for people who have never even played World of Darkness or let alone heard it about it. Yep, I agree. Um, I So like mine, I would say, is the lightest on the, the lore of the world. Um, Second, yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, mine, I guess, was like meant to be like the intro story to like... There's some Easter eggs here, like if you know where to look, but it's not going to make or break whether or not you understand. And I think that that's true for all three of the stories, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like um, Cass and Caitlin give a lot of context for the world. So um, it's great. It's great. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I would definitely say I was able to figure things out by context, but I, I wrote letters, not letters, sentences down where it was like a dust born who follows a Camarilla law going, I only understand half that sentence. So I didn't know if there was an index or something where someone could find what is this Camarilla law and some of it you kind of allude to when she says doing this is going to break it or if I don't do this I would break it but it's yeah. not spelled out there so for someone who's like I'd like to read that first before I do it is there is there one of the resources or a book that you say this is the go-to yeah, like I recommend like a website yeah a website. I, I, I'm sure I am sure there is at least one wiki that is completely up to date on it um but if you were going to in terms of just a book I think the the core rule book Yes, is pretty much like we had access to anything we wanted to pull from lore wise. Um, but most of our stuff is based off of what you can find in the core rule book. Um, and not even you don't even get that deep into it. They give a like the first couple chapters are just the overview of the world. It's told in a narrative format. Um, and then it gets down to the nitty gritty of how you would actually implement that in a in a game system. Um, and they're fun rule books to read because they are really narrative. Like I, I read them again with no ability or intent to actually play them. And I wildly enjoyed them so they're worth giving it a shot yeah, sorry i'm looking at the links because Thank i'm married that way this might help people yeah because i mean i just I, I understood everything but i remember the same thing as allison like i just there were a couple times when i was like i wonder what this means like the vampire who is thin blood yeah i was like so, i don't know what that is so with mine i i think you can follow the plot just fine if you don't know stuff 
But mm -hmm. if you do know what certain things mean, you can maybe see some of the twists coming a little mm -hmm. bit earlier, Ooh. or you can sort of, oh. um, in, you can figure out some of the undercurrents of what's going on that you don't need to understand it. And again, I wrote it just like we all did. We wrote ours with a eye towards keeping the lore relatively light. Um, mm -hmm. And, but it's, it, there's something there for new people as well as people who've already, or who are super familiar with the game and are, you know, they mm -hmm. know all the lore already. There aren't going to be any surprises, but there are going to be little Easter eggs of, oh, I can see how that would pan out. And that's not a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, and reading all of them, we knew nothing about it going in. And I know I still found them all completely accessible, but there were times where I'd read the sentence and go, okay, someone's going to have to unpack this for me because <laughs> I don't have the context to get it. But I still completely got into all the narratives and the characters. And I was telling Jen, this is probably one of my worst analogies ever. It's probably kind of like reading some of the Star Wars books where if you haven't mm -hmm. seen the movies, maybe you don't know what Jedi and Sith and all this stuff are, but you'll figure it out from context. But if you've seen all the movies, then you'll know all the backstories and you'll get more from it. Hello, Hello. Hello. <laughs> So, So this is a very interesting project. So some of you, I mean, how did you get this job? I think it's like, how did <laughs> this happen? I'm like, how did it happen? Did like your agents put you up for this? Where did the, was there a call put out? And like, how did this happen? My agent reached out and was like, are you interested in this project? And I'm like, yeah, okay. Then he sent me the um, non-disclosure agreement. I sent him five emails that were just incoherent gibberish because <laughs> how excited I was. And I think at the end, it was him going like, I assume that's a yes. I'm like, yes. If there's 50 exclamation points, it's a yes. Yes, if you're typing all, in all caps. When all three of us came in, on the project because we came in at varying times too. None of us knew what it was for until we signed the NDA. Mm -hmm. So until we got the NDA to sign. So how do you agree to something or even test the waters to be whether or not you'd be interested? Because I, I know, for example, my agent has been sending stuff out to all her clients going, hey, do you have any interest on IPs just generally? Didn't specifically say which ones. And then if you do, then there would be more interest films to, for interest forms to fill out. Too many Fs there. And then you could figure out more, I guess, which IPs there are to work on. But the whole idea of working on in a, a world that's already existing would have a lot of constraints, but also a lot of opportunity there. I guess I'm just surprised that two of you weren't already familiar with the world and you still were like, yes, I still want to do this. So for, for me, my agent already knew that I was interested in writing about lowercase v vampires uh, because I lowercase had, v. Yes, because <laughs> I had written... Um, like some books in high school. So it was one of my, like my interests. Um, so when she found out about this project, she reached out to me and was like, Hey, would you like to do a lowercase V vampire project? And I was like, sure. And then I got the NDA and I was like, Oh, I see now. <laughs> that's very, very cool. So yeah, I'm just like mystified by this whole thing. I just find it really exciting and secretive and um, I love how that would also like tie into fine print in a way where <laughs> it's like. <laughs> okay, was there any fine print into? for you ladies that you went, oh, nobody told me this when I started writing it. Any any surprises along the way once once you'd already signed that NDA and signed your life away? If we say anything, we'll get killed. So I don't think. <laughs> no, I probably should yeah. just, just forget I I'm gonna unask that question. Yeah. I'm just going to drink. Yeah. I was going to say, the, <laughs> one of like the rival uh, vampire clans would mm -hmm. come and, and kill all of us. I think I'm using the wrong words. Um, Probably so, all of them. All of them, I know. Um, so when you found out it was Vampire the Masquerade and you were screaming, and did you realize the, the heaviness of that? How this is, I believe it's the first novel, the first fictional novel set in that universe, correct? In this edition. No. In this, in this edition, edition, yeah. Oh. There's been a so lot there, of fine media before this. Yeah. Before the oh, okay. ones. Yeah. All right. I couldn't remember when I got like the press release from your publicist. I was like, is this the first book? The first Vampire the Masquerade novel? Back in the, the early to mid 2000s, there were a whole bunch of clan based novels. So there was like, um, you know, Tremere and Malkavian and all this stuff. And I, I read those growing up as well. Um, just they, my local comic store had them. And, but it's been a while since there has been a, um, there's, and there's been a bunch of comic tie-ins in the meantime, video mm -hmm. games, stuff like that. But this is like the first time they've done a long form prose thing in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be wrong, but I'm gonna guess 10 years. Only 10 years? I could, 
Maybe it's longer. I feel like I actually longer. don't know what time is anymore. So I can no one knows that the pandemic is. It's been a while. It has been a while. Yes, because this past year alone has really been like fifteen years. Well, and I don't really know how some of this works as far as there had to have been interest, otherwise they would have been looking for you ladies to write this book. But I know this existed back when I was in late high school. I didn't know it persisted this long. Are people still playing this? Is there still interest? Mm -hmm. Or has it moved beyond that to be more of a thing where they're playing like video games and reading books about it? Or people, I'm getting lots of nods. So everybody's saying, yes, it's it's still being played because otherwise they would be like, yeah. there's there's no audience for this. But it's clearly, still being played. There are definitely, there are live streams of active play, you know, live play games on YouTube if you want to go search for them. There's some very good ones out there. Um, in our case, it was at least partially because there is going to be a new video game coming out in the nearish future. Um, and so they were timing the release of the new fifth edition with that. And they brought us on then there were new comic books. And so it, it is sort of like a new push because yeah. um, the big thing is they update it. So it takes place in contemporary settings. So if you use the rule books that were printed in the mid 2000s, the world's changed a bit. So part of fifth edition, aside from some rule adjustments, was to move the timeline of the world along and update it to what current players are interested in pursuing, basically. And I think that even if it wasn't really being heavily played right now, the circumstances that led to it being, you know, part of paradox would just kind of push it forward. Um, if I remember correctly, the license for White Wolf was purchased by CCP Games some time ago. They tried to make a video game. It didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. And then kind of Paradox was like, well, we want it now. And so it trotted off of it. And both companies are relatively large. So they're going to want to push it, like just on the sheer mercenary level. No, I totally, I totally get that. And, and you know, you didn't release a book by this is Harper Voyager. This is a big press unless they thought there's a reason to do that. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like a full company front. We're going to get new things out there. But just getting back to something Caitlin was saying, the fact that it is a modern world, all these stories were very much so modern set. You could feel everything from down to where's your cell phone? Are we using cell phones? So that nice juxtaposition, because I know some of the vampire novels I read growing up, Anne mm -hmm. Rice fan here, you know, we're running around New Orleans before the Civil War. No one's got cell phones. And, you know, you're lucky if you can get a message by way of some dude on a horseback, which you could easily kill. You know, it's just a lot easier <laughs> to stop a message that way. So I loved how all three of you guys in incorporated current technology and a really modern vibe for each of these stories, but still having that thread of this is some kind of ancient tradition woven through the modern mm -hmm. day. So. I don't know if you, if any of you want to speak to that as far as how you brought in those ancient traditions or if you're like, oh, I just like the modern part. I want to know how Cassandra ended up in Iceland, but that's OK. Wow. <laughs> like Iceland. Jen's like, it's in Iceland. I was so excited. <laughs> I'm going to Iceland in a few months. So like the second the vampires were in like, like Iceland, I'm like, yes. Iceland's such a lovely place. If you go down there, um, this has nothing to do with your questions or your statements. Don't eat on the high street. Avoid the main area like go into the docks the prices of things go down and the quality goes up um i lived in iceland for a little while which is how oh, yeah. i was yeah. did Love you go it. to the famous hot dog stand i did they're actually really really good <laughs> really like this Icelandic that's, hot dogs. that's amazing i've been trying to get, get to iceland for like 10 years so i was also very excited when <laughs> i saw that when like you know reading your story for the first time i was like if you ever I go know. try to find a tacos icelandic fusion tacos are amazing what kind of do i want to know what kind of meats in there because part of me doesn't I just feel like as a vegetarian i, I might not enjoy it <laughs> you might not <laughs> it's gonna be like you know like seal face or something like that and i'll be like no sheep's head sheep yeah. Probably cheese, sheep's head. Now, Jen is still scarred because we had an author a few weeks ago that had oh. some some cuisine that I think just broke her inside. Why? And vegetarian Why? just. Um, well, let's see. I don't think you're bothered by the fox. Yeah, it wasn't was... the black paella that bothered you or the squid. It was it was the definitely the, the live markets. Yeah, and the fact yeah. That, yeah, like she because um, her book took place. Um, Oh gosh! I can't but that was not, that. I don't know if that Vanuatu. was part. I was I was going to say I don't know if that part was in Vanuatu or when they were still in they were still in Manila for a lot. I think of they it. were still in Manila when they ate the flying fox. Yeah, and I was like, just skip this paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> That's really gross. 
and also sad and flying foxes are adorable. How, how'd you, uh, how'd you feel about the land of milk and honey with all of my um, knowledge I, about Oregon butchery laws? I won't lie to you. I loved the story, but I did message Allison. I was like, there's a lot of meat going on here. And she's like, I, I know I feel bad. I'm sorry. And I'm like, I love the story. But again, I was just like, oh, the sheep. She's so bad because my book has like one barbecue scene. And she's like, I don't know if I can handle this part either. <laughs> I think I had them eating kale then either. But it's still, she's just... The sensibilities of vegetarian are different, but no, but, but Caitlin, you you wove together. And I think a vegetarian would respect how you handle it because there's a lot going on there about how we treat meat, how we treat people, and just the, the there's a line you I don't know if I managed. Oh, I did. Uh, the, the comparative root words or just the uh, linguistics of humanitarian and vegetarian. <laughs> that might be my favorite in the entire this novella. That line about humanitarian Historical vampire joke. Yeah, <laughs> I loved it. So when you were all working on these projects separately, did you did you meet each other? Did you talk to each other? Did you bounce ideas off each other? Or was it completely, completely separate? It was completely, completely separate. separate. Yeah, I can't remember when we, when we were actually introduced to each other, but I know it was after my first draft was in and I was the last person brought on. So it was pretty much just, we were brought together for past pages and publicity stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Have any of you actually met in real life? Yes. Yes, Cass and I had. <laughs> Genevieve's like, wait. Oh, like, oh I promise. That's just <laughs> this, was in the, this was in the before times at, at various conferences. There was a very <laughs> fun time at Emerald City Comic Con. If That's it was awesome. 2020, nobody was allowed to do anything, but I don't know how long you guys have been working on it. But had you guys, so Caitlin and Cassandra, you had met before this even started. Just completely unrelated because we knew each oh. other on Twitter. And then we were both at Emerald City Comic Con. And oh. I yeah, we had a great. We had a great one, actually. Well, the, we, yeah, we met a second time. But I think the first time was Emerald City Comic Con when you had oh, that great yeah, interdisciplinary. You were going west. No, was it? West, no, yeah, it wasn't Emerald. Yeah. It was Pax East, actually. I was Pax East. Yes. Okay. That Authors, makes sense. You need to write down when you meet each other. You will be asked. There you will be, be asked. Yeah. Later. <laughs> I just remembered that it involved kidnapping. Wes Schneider, yes. from Pathfinder, from mm -hmm. one of his panels. Um, he trusted me to take him to a secondary location just on my promise that I knew Cass and that they wanted to see us. What's that work now? Yeah. <laughs> I know you were both coming to say hi. Yeah, I think you assumed that I already knew him. I did not know him. I just kidnapped him from the stage of one of his panels. <laughs> and he just went with you. He just went with me. Okay. It was a, it was a lovely, lovely panel, panel, and I think um, of people in the world. Possibly was an escape hatch out of the post-conference discussion or the post-panel discussion. People are very trusting at comic conventions. Mm -hmm. Let this be a lesson to all of us. I Don't know. let someone take you to a secondary location. No, no matter how adorable. Well, I, I a good just, life lesson. Well, I'm, I'm curious. So, Caitlin, you were the last one brought on. So, I'm wondering if they looked at different stories to figure out how these would work together because they really do all have very different feels, but they work together really well. Like Genevieve, you were saying earlier, yours is kind of that starter, that, that intro, the most accessible because well, not everybody's gone to college, but enough of us have that we can be in that kind of mindset and be like, I've been that freshman who feels like her roommate hates her and just wants to go home and then crawl under a rock and never come out again. And you we've all had so terrible well. roommates. We've just all give you a had hug. terrible roommates. <laughs> Hopefully most of us hadn't had them that bad, like yours. I, I was saying something to my husband a little while ago, saying, you know, we have RAs. She could have gone and talked to her RA. I really wish we would have talked to her RA. <laughs> Funnily enough, one of my best friends from high school it was an RA in college. And after reading the story, she was like, Jen, I've seen much worse than burritos on pillows. Oh, like, I wasn't is... going to say anything about the burrito on the pillow because that's like one of the most heartbreaking scenes. So I didn't want to spoil it, but oh, just... It was heartbreaking because I imagined it as a Chipotle burrito and I was so <laughs> starving and I'm like, oh, and now it's all over the pillow. Yeah. It broke my heart in so many ways. <laughs> well, and food and even the relationship with food, it was a theme through all three of you. And I don't know if that was intentional or not. I mean, I, oh. I, have, path I have pathological issues with not writing too much about food, but it, even in a minor way, like in Genevieve, you have a character who's depressed and who is possibly, you never really define how she looks to start, but people are commenting on her unintentional weight loss, 
that's coming not because she's not trying to eat but because she's actually focused on something and then how that makes her feel that she's finally being noticed but not in the way or for the reason she would want so i don't know if that was something that was intentional that there was going to be a relationship with food that you talked about and then there was an effort to make that happen or if this was just a happy accident i think it was just a happy accident um, food accident yeah not just like food yeah a lot. <laughs> Um, because to your earlier point, the, uh, when I was brought on, so for all three of us, they didn't tell us what they wanted us to write. So mm -hmm. sometimes with IP, they give you an outline and they say, okay, you know, elaborate on this. Um, in our case, they kind of just ask us to pitch them ideas. Um, and I went through like three or four ideas before we found one that they liked. Um, I was brought on because, or at least partially because uh, the editor for this collection was also the editor for my first book. Oh, so nice. he already knew me. He knew I could turn stuff around pretty quickly. He knew I liked writing horror. And so he reached out and was like, do you want to do a horror novella length project? Um, here's the timeline. And I went, sure, got the NDA, screamed a lot because it was Vampire the Masquerade, and then proceeded to keep throwing ideas at him and the Paradox team that they were like, that's interesting, but it doesn't fit the other two books. So, oh. so they did pick one that they felt was related, but touched on different topics so that it wasn't too uh, samey. Because at least one of my ideas, they were like, this is great, but we already have fine print, mm. essentially. Um, so, so, but beyond that, they weren't that involved. They double checked our lore, make sure we didn't break the rules of, of the universe. Um, and other than that, you know, we all came up with our own ideas pretty much on our own and they just went, awesome, have fun, that's gross. <laughs> which oh, is exactly what you want to hear like that you I really remember do when like you think of that, about that too. so how many ideas did uh the other authors how many ideas did you guys pitch before they you hit on the idea um i, I it was my first one um we got into the meeting and I basically talked over our poor editor in my excitement. I was like, I know exactly what I want to do. It is going to be this. What do you think I'm going to set in here? I, this is what I want to do with this particular client. They were like, cool. <laughs> Go do it. Yes. <laughs> and very well done, I must add. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that that was the idea that took off. But Caitlin, you have other ideas there. Do those maybe go in later novels or later anthologies? Or if, if fine print, if one of yours was too close to fine print, then maybe not that one. But Sounds like there's some more untapped stories we might get out of you. I would like to write any of the ones I came up with. One of them, we did make sure from, from a business perspective, and I don't know how much of your audience is like author business focused as opposed to like writing craft focused, but on a business perspective, my I was like, hey, they just turned down that idea and I really like it. And I think it doesn't have to be Vampire the Masquerade. And my agent went in and carved that out and made sure that that idea, even though we pitched it to them, that's still mine. So right. it, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know when that would happen, but um, it's definitely, it's come up in conversation since then when doing career planning, what sets. And then the other one, like, yeah, if, if they want to have me write the gothic horror vampire novella that I had planned with, you know, it was basically a, a newly turned vampire in a household filled with other vampires that were created specifically for their, like the big headmaster to feed off of. And so she's trying to, you know, become strong enough that that's not going to happen to her. I would love to write that. I'd read that. I'd read that. It'd be great. Me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Genevieve, I was just saying, Genevieve, did you, did you have more than one idea or did you just steamroll them like Cassandra did? <laughs> Mine uh, had kind of the same general premise. Like Cleo was already main character. She was already a depressed college student, but like the beats of the story um, were something that, um, my editor and I went back and forth on, or our editor and I went back and forth on. Um, just, so yeah. So it changed a lot from like my original pitch, but it was still the same like bones. Yeah. How did you get her name by the way? Because there's there's a lot of meat, sorry. Um, okay. there's, there's a lot of hay, let's use that instead. There's a lot of hay made out of making fun of her name and how, she, how she's called different things. Was there a specific reason you called her that or you just like the name? I just like the name. That's I thought fair. it was interesting, so. It's very. It's like it's always so like naming characters to me. Sometimes they just like pop right away, and I'm like, I know this person's name, I know everything about them. And then other times you just. Do you ever struggle any of you with that when you're just like, what do I call this random person? And sometimes I just name them after people I know, and then I have to like go back and switch it because I'm like. Oh. <laughs> the uh, protagonist in mine, Lee, her last name is a friend's last name, 
and I got her permission to use her last name. <laughs> And then I told her what the first name was, and she went, "That's my middle name." <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And you're, okay, so you're saying her name's Lee because I would have thought that was Lay. I've that. always pronounced it Lee. It doesn't really matter that much um, in this case, but um, also uh, the the blood mage in mine, Joe Latska, is named after a good friend of mine <laughs> who has a very similar but slightly different Polish last name. <laughs> but it's same thing. I went, "Hey, I'm going to name this character after you." This is what she's like. What do you think? And she's awesome. See, that is, that is good. Yeah. And I still, I still names from reality all the time, and you just kind of mix and match. So you're like, okay, so uh, this friend's husband's first name, that friend's husband's last name. I have a new character here. <laughs> they're, they're fine. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they don't own their last name. They don't own their first names, and I, and I would never do that with a character that is in any way a, a, a negative character. I think I would run it by them first. By the way, I'm killing you off or something like that. that would, I feel like all of my characters are negative characters. So I, I would just would, like, I feel like almost anybody would like read my book and be like, I am offended that you chose my name for this person. You hope not. I hope not. So yeah. Or well, I just name them after the actors I want to play them in the movie. Exactly. Oh, that's a good idea. I might steal that. Yeah, that it's, it's very easy. It's very easy very that you don't have to even worry about it when you're reading it. You're like, yep, easily picturing it. I barely you, I changed your last you name. That's it. The protagonist to like Gwendolyn Christie, though. Are they all named Gwendolyn? <laughs> Did you Chris Christie, Gwendolyn, and Gwendolyn Christie? Um, <laughs> then you do versions of Brienne, uh, Phasma, something, something along that line. You can go really yeah, okay. wars with it. But that I works. think I think you're safe. Just <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't name all of my male characters Adam Driver. Yes, you right. have. Most of them are I'm, named Adam Driver. <laughs> one of them is named Adam, but half of them are Adam Driver. <laughs> Adam, okay. hopefully his reps don't contact the show and go, could you please stop referencing me in every episode? <laughs> I feel like it's been like a couple of weeks since we've mentioned him. <laughs> Maybe. I, I haven't done like a little tally going, how often do we get here? But I, I do want to say just the way that these three novels work together as a novella, I mean, you know, I would love to see more from each one of those, but each one of you have other books coming out or that are already out. How different are they from what this was? Because it sounds like we've got Norse gods, we've got steampunk, we've got cyber things. Was it, was it something where you were having to pause something else to write this or were those other projects done? Everybody's just looking at me. Uh Trying to figure out, I think it's because like what you, I mean, you two write as well. Like you kind of jump between projects. I, I don't. don't. No, really? Like, no, and no. yeah, so Jen, Jen knows my, my brain has kind of gotten fried because I started a project, then was told, mm, and so I stopped, started something else, and then we'll, let's go back and revisit that. And so my brain has turned, <gasps> it's, it's, my brain's this right now, this kind of liquidy red mush is just up here. So I just yeah, I, I, everyone bounced between projects. Well, and, I, <laughs> and I bounce between genres as a as a palate cleanser. So Jen introduces, I write the bourbon books. This is not bourbon. She's drinking bourbon. But I also write literary sci-fi. And I go back and forth between them because the romance is a lot, it's a lot lighter. It doesn't require mm -hmm. me to world build because it's contemporary set. I'm like, this is Austin. I can do this without having to really stop and figure out crazy things happening. But if you guys are all like, oh, I'm always doing crazy things, then there's no break for you anyway. <laughs> I mean, Genevieve, you're doing, yours Yours was the one with Norse gods from a side character. Can you tell us who the side character is? Um, the giantess Ankerboda, who's known as the mother of three very interesting children by Loki. Um, so that's so what she's gotten with Loki. Disney Plus, are you hearing this? I know. <laughs> I'm like, Loki's hot. It's, <laughs> and it's airing today, so I'm, I'm yeah. I'm expecting my Disney Plus to crash when we try to watch it, but. <laughs> yeah, um, but it, I think, man, because we wrote these stories in like 2019, late 2019 is when we originally drafted them. In the they, times. Yeah, they came out uh, as audiobooks first. Mm -hmm. um, but, so it feels like a lifetime ago. It feels like a lot has happened since I first wrote, since, I don't know, since we first wrote. Well, there the was stories. a pandemic, but go on. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, the world think, ended, and then it, it didn't. And then it right. didn't. A little bit. At the time, I think I was still waiting on like my first round of edits for The Witch's Heart, like when I wrote this. So when I say a lot has happened, like with other projects, a lot has happened. Well, especially if it came out in audiobook first, I didn't realize that it had done that. Was there a, a business strategic reason why they would have launched it audio without the, the paper? 
I've never heard of that happening. I've, I've heard okay. of people watching books I, the audio comes later. There was a reason, wasn't there? The, there was a reason. I, I mean, I think the main reason was that I think it was probably a combo of timing of, um, cause I was right in the middle of the paper shortage too, I think. Mm -hmm. um, cause there was that time when there was like no paper to print books on and they had to really stagger releases. Um, but also they were really hoping because it's a gaming property that it would, ca it would capture that um, like podcast and YouTube streamer market mm -hmm. um, as audio first. And then they, they followed it up later. I, I personally still prefer eBooks, even though I love audio. Um, I like having at least both so I can have the option of going in between the two as opposed to like not having any way to check the written version. Um, but it was a really cool um, project and all of our narrators are fantastic. So, so they different narrators? narrators? Yes, yeah. they're all different narrators. I like that Alice and I asked the same question at the same time and both like lurched forward. <laughs> well, and because we both, we both, we were given a copy to read to prep for the show. I usually, if I can get it on audio, I do because I got three short people. I don't have a lot of time to sit and just read. So mm -hmm. I'm usually re reading while I'm doing dishes, while I'm doing laundry. So I'm glad to know it's available in audio because that's, that's kind of for those of us who have commutes or small people. You know, we don't have time to sit and like stare at words. What is that? I love my narrator so much. Our editor gave us a list of possible narrators and I saw his name, Neil Kaplan, and he actually voiced a whole bunch of um, characters that really enjoy video games. And also oh. he was the voice of Optimus Prime. Yeah, for I was about to say, wasn't he a farmer? And I was like, shut up. I That's need awesome. Optimus Prime to be my narrator. And my editor was like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, yes, because all I want in my head canon is just Optimus Prime reading fine print on a nice leather sofa somewhere. <laughs> this is amazing. I love the specificity of that vision. Yes. Like he's it was very, mind. very much a specific thing I needed and wanted in my life. Jen's narrator, Eric Ishii, is like, a big, well-known vampire of the masquerade LARPer, among other things. So like yeah. she had just been in a really fairly successful live stream game, right? Yep, yep, yes. I think it was LA by Night. Yeah, I think she's in LA by Night. Um, she's also voicing a lot of really yes. cool characters and a lot of enormous games. Yeah, yeah, she is so cool. I feel like I lucked out um, like with her as a narrator because she's just like the most awesome person and I still like follow her on Twitter. I'm like, 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 you are so cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, I still, I still follow Lexi. My story, like what? So wait, I, did you two have the same narrator then? No. no. Okay. I, so you, so Caitlin, you were talking about Genevieve's narrator. Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, narrator. I thought you were talking about your narrator, Erica. Yeah, I, I didn't. And then Genevieve got excited. So I realized, okay, you're talking about yeah. her. You so sure Erica narrated. narrated Genevieve's, Exy Sands narrated mine, and I am a terrible person and I'm blanking on everything oh, else. She's, even though she's done person. so much, um, but she is fantastic. Also takes really, really great photo photographs, like her Instagram. Yes. Um, <laughs> to follow her. But it, but it was interesting though, because so I, I read mine out loud, both to check for typos and also because like I knew it was gonna be audio first. And I'm like, well, I better make sure it's for, it's for only time I've read in first person professionally. I gotta make sure it sounds like fun to listen to um, and like voicey and character E yeah. and everything else. So I read it out loud and I really like how I read it out loud. And, and XE does it completely differently than I do, but still really, really well. But it's always fascinating to me to like to listen to it because I'm like, this is a different Lee. Yes. Yes. Slightly so, different. The same thing here. Happen. I went to school for theater, so when I'm writing, I, I voice the characters and I do it out loud. And then when my books came out in audio, I was like, that is a completely different take on how I thought of like how they would sound, how they would pause their words. And I was like, oh, that, that's probably better than what I was doing in some cases. I'm just like, oh, that is a better choice. <laughs> so it is always interesting to hear somebody else give voice to your words. I've never thought of Optimus Prime reading my books and now I want to. <laughs> I know. I'm like, well, we've all got our kinks and I feel like that's a nice specific <laughs> one right Prime there. Optimus Prime is a kink. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Rule 34 exists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, my husband just crazy. quoted that to me last night and I stared at him. I'm like, is this one of Asimov's law? He's like, no, it is not. And I went, <laughs> and then he explained it. So you, you all can Google that. I'm not going to explain what rule 34 is now. <laughs> I, but I was, I was just laughing just at the whole idea of, hey, this was done through 
narration and then you wouldn't necessarily have known how they were all going to sound together and i just i loved how they worked together just as a group that way did the narrators have to get on the same page so they would do things the same style or, or were they wildly different takes i have not listened to the audiobook all the way through i've only listened to my audiobook <laughs> oh my gosh so <laughs> so that, that's a that's a terrible <laughs> confession but it's true I'm like, sorry, just for that, you need to drink the Underberg now. Yeah, I already did it. I did it while you guys were watching, and then I, I mean, like I muted my mic so I could like cough in peace. How bad is it? God, I keep it thinking like, well, I'm used to it, right? I'm, I'm had, yeah. my my spouse and I shove these in each other's stockings every Christmas, and then have to drink them on Christmas Day. So like, you'd think I'd be used to it. No, but it is lethal. Well, it's like absinthe or something like that. Like you always think, oh, I'm kind of used it's, to it now, but then you're like, I'm never used to it. It is a more assertive flavor than absinthe by okay. a lot. And it does not pair well with margaritas, which I, I don't know why I you're told you if I'd asked myself. I didn't ask myself. So I've had to process that all on my own. That's okay. There's a whole like novel a right there. Uh. <laughs> Underberg versus margaritas. <laughs> So, I think this is how like the vampires must feel when they try to eat real food and they're like, oh, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> this is a bad combo. Things that do not pair well. Well, and you were suggesting I should have paired a, what was like some kind of kale smoothie with some very high brand gin yes. to go with land of milk and honey. But I was thinking, do I get a rack of lamb with it? And then Jen would have been grossed out when we would have been able to do the show. <laughs> so no, and this is an easy television. Save the lambs. I will, I will say I have never actually paired gin with kale, so I don't really know if it works. I just think it would work. I theoretically. Th theoretically. Because they're both like plants, so. Yeah, 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 going for the botanical. As I'm like grimacing, I'm like, ugh. That's just... the, only, the only kale smoothies I've actually ever had have also had like banana and almond butter and honey in them. So like they have not tasted like kale. They've just been green. Well, and I've been drinking a lot of like the fresh juices instead of stopping at Starbucks. I'm like, I'm getting my green energy. And they usually have half a banana or something else in there. So they don't really taste like that. But then I come home and eat like a snowball from Tasty Cake. So it's balanced. <laughs> it's okay. We all have to have our superfoods while we're like eating nachos or something. I drink like this weird beet drink. That's like beautiful and blood red, but it's beets. And, you should like, have that today. Stuff. That would have been beautiful. I have it in the morning. <laughs> Vampires in the morning. Vampires in the morning. All right, friends, we are out of time. This has been awesome. Ooh, I hear a siren coming. I was like, is that you mine? I left next to a busy intersection. That's okay. Um, I just want to thank all of you for being here. Everyone who's watching this live or watching it on the replay, check out their websites, buy Walk Among Us, buy their solo it's books. It's you won't be disappointed. Um, I just want to thank Pam Stack and everybody at the Global Authors on the Air Radio Network. This is a copywritten podcast by Global Authors on the Air. I want to thank Roman Seraton, our producer. And everybody who is watching this, stay tuned. Next week, we have Josh Mallerman of Bird Box fame and just every book I've ever loved to, so much that I want to cry. So uh, tune in next week while I openly uh, panic weep and fangirl all over Josh. If I have to do the opening, I'll do the opening. I'm going to be crying. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, stay tuned next week for my tears. <laughs>